Hunting isn't what it used to be. Is it going the way of the dinosaur? Well, we hope to find that out on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast. Hello, everyone. We get lots of letters, as you know, and we try to answer questions, jumping right in with our patrons. We always answer their questions first. And Joseph wrote in a couple of days ago and said, hey, Ron, I live in Alaska. And I'm looking at buying a Saco 85 in 338 Winchester Magnum for my do everything hunting rifle. I currently use a 4570. My question is about bullets. Do you have any experience with North Fork soft points? I had the opportunity to buy about 200, 250 grain bullets in 338 caliber from an estate sale. And it looks like they can be loaded to around 2,600 feet per second. From what little I can find out on them, they look to be about like a swift A-frame. Anyway, thanks for your time. Joey, yes, I think those North Forks are worth a try. They've got a pretty good reputation as a bonded soft point with solid copper shanks that retain significant weight and penetrate very well. They uh, originally were made in Wyoming and then moved to Oregon, but now they're in Sweden of all places. And there are some really nice guys there. I met them at the Dallas Safari Club show recently and was really impressed with their enthusiasm. And they showed me their line of bullets, including a new cupped solid. That's kind of a backup bullet for dangerous game. But I like their solid copper shank bullets with a bonded lead nose. And they've got ribbing around the shank to reduce uh, copper falling and pressure. So I think they're definitely worth a try. All right, here's another patron, Max. Hey, Ron, I had a question that I thought maybe many people could benefit from. I know a lot of people dry fire practice with their firearms, and I've heard from some that it's totally okay. Uh, and I've heard from others that this, say that that damages your firearm. I've also heard that it depends on the type of firearm, a shotgun, pistol, rifle, and et cetera. Also the type of cartridge, rim fire versus center fire. So what is okay and not okay when it comes to dry fire practice? And what are the mechanics in the firearm that either make dry fire okay or damage the firearm? What is being damaged? I love the podcast. Thanks, Ron. Uh, good idea, Max. I will try to incorporate those ideas into a video. Uh, for now, though, basically any modern center fire is fine to dry fire as are most modern rim fires, even the Ruger 1022 now. The original didn't used to be. Here's what's going on. The firing pins are built with a two-stage or two-level diameter with a wider diameter at the back that catches on something, usually inside of the bolt body, before the actual narrow pin strikes the breech rim in the case of rim fires or punches too far forward in the case of center fires. So there's just enough of the firing pin uh, in both cases that pokes forward enough to fire the cartridge, but not so far forward as to damage the pin if that makes any sense to you guys. So think of a firing pin as kind of a long needle. And instead of being the same diameter all the way through the bolt, projecting forward to hit the cartridge, uh, part of it toward the back is wider in diameter. And then there's another surface within the bolt body that that strikes while the remaining thin part that protrudes from the face of the bolt and hits the primer is just long enough to strike the primer. So you're really stopping that firing pin back there at the heavier part. So there's really nothing to break on the firing pin itself. And uh, do check though with your manufacturer. As I said, most bolt actions, most modern firearms have that feature and it's not an issue. But if you're at all worried about it, just get a hold of the manufacturer and ask them because dry fire practice is absolutely the best way, an inexpensive way to become a better rifleman. It's just trigger control rifle control. I always recommend you aim at a target, and it doesn't matter if it's in your bedroom, or your living room, or your yard. Empty firearm, make darn sure everything's empty, empty, empty. Don't take any chances there. But once that's done, you can then aim and get your sight picture. And just that whole process of picking up the rifle, getting it into position quickly, getting your sight picture on your target smoothly, all of that builds muscle memory and familiarity with your rifle so that you're much faster in the field. And then keep both eyes open and on target and click. Concentrate on breaking that trigger without jerking it. Concentrate on keeping your sight picture on the target. That's the critical part. And then breaking the trigger cleanly without jerking, that's the other critical part. Do those two things. That's dry firing. And it's like, 
it's like a baseball player warming up, imagining that pitch coming in and seeing the stitches on the ball as it comes in and making the hit. Any sport where you think about it ahead of time and you pre-visualize, similar thing going on when you dry fire practice. You do that enough times again and again. And once you get to live ammunition in the field, you're going to find you're practically an expert already. <laughs> you still have to figure out your trajectories and wind deflections and such. But boy, do you know how to handle that firearm. All right, this is from, let's see, it's a simple question. Where did it go? Um, Klaus from Germany. Now, this is a little disturbing. Thank God I live in the USA is what I thought when I read this one. Klaus says, you need a special license in Germany for reloading. And to get it, you have to do a course and a test. And the authorities will do a background check. And they'll additionally check where and how you will store your gunpowder, etc. While limiting you uh, while limiting you on the amount of gunpowder that you're allowed to buy. And each time you have to document the purchase in a special book and store it over a certain period of time. Oh, <laughs> Being a hunter in Germany, yes, another license is needed by the local authority before you're even allowed to buy a suppressor. And it's linked in the documents to your rifle. And same as the rifle, you must have all the serial numbers registered and documented after buying. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, Klaus, all I can say is I'm sorry. <laughs> but and the reason I say thank God I live in the USA, of course, is because of our guaranteed Second Amendment rights. You know, your basic right to liberty and the pursuit of happiness. This is one of them. And as a reason, our founders made it the Second Amendment, the guaranteed bill of rights. We have rights to think what we want, say what we want, be who we want. We have the right to protect ourselves and our families and defend ourselves with firearms as a basic human right and on down the list of the basic bill of rights. Unfortunately, many, many, well, most other countries don't have such a thing. But boy, I would sure recommend folks over there try to get it. Because as we know, throughout history, governments just tend to like to rule over the masses and tell them what to do and when to do and how to do it. So, yeah, tough. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's see. Oh, this is an, uh, a bunch of responses to a video I did called Hunting Ain't What It Used To Be. And Max writes in and says, I remember as a group, as boys years ago, were wandering through town and we would meet up at a place outside of town that we called the Rock Pile. We all carried rifles. I seriously doubt you could do that today. <laughs> yeah, I seriously doubt it too, Max. But I did the same thing. Friends and I would say, hey, let's go pheasant hunting after school. We'd run home, grab our shotguns, and walk from our homes through the suburban areas. And, of course, small town America, I couldn't really call it suburban. You were probably three blocks from out of town on any direction. <laughs> but we would often go right down Main Street, past all the shops, out to the railroad tracks, because the ditches along the railroad were a great place for pheasants, and then hunt our way out. And I can remember shooting pheasants barely outside of the city limit and some weed piles along the tracks and such. And nobody thought anything of it because I don't know, we were living in a saner world at that time, but I hear this a lot from the older guys. Yeah. Things have really changed. Now in a similar vein, Jack is writing in and he's talking about why hunting ain't what it used to be. He says, nobody has access to land anymore. And that's not a hundred percent true, but it's largely true. A big part of the reason that we can't find easy hunting and many people are dropping out of hunting is we can't get access to places with a lot of game and good hunting on them because private land is, is either leased up by outfitters or wealthy individuals own it and just keep everyone else out. It's just not the egalitarian society we had 60 years ago, 100 years ago, where most people were rural living off the land and or at least had some relatives, grandpas, uncles that had farms and such. And when everyone had roughly 180 to four, 500 acres of land, and they were all pretty much in the same economic strata, well, you could hunt on Joe's place and Joe would hunt on your place and pretty much worked out nicely that way. Everyone shared. Uh, and, but then there were no lawsuits when someone stubbed his toe or tore his finger on your crossing over your barbed wire fence or something. All of that stuff has changed, I think, for the worst. Um, maybe things will straighten out later, but for now, and it's become, I've got mine and hope you get yours kind of an attitude. 
But if you're living in a rural area, or even if you're urban and you know folks who are living out in the country on ranch land or farmland, it's certainly possible to get to be friends with them enough to where they trust you and then they will let you hunt without paying exorbitant fees. But the outfitters or the individuals and or clubs that lease land also put a crimp in things because they get tired of being ignored or kicked off of land or not allowed to hunt. So they finally say, look, I really, really want to hunt. Why don't we all get together and offer this landowner some money to let us hunt, but nobody else. And then we'll at least have ours. And then the other one, of course, is someone with enough money can buy a bunch of land and say, I've got my paradise. And now we're getting into the old European style of the landed nobility owning all the land and you need a Robin Hood <laughs> to set the thing straight. It's, it's kind of sad, but we predicted this decades and decades ago. It just seems to happen as the population increases and open land decreases, uh, the opportunities to hunt decline. Well, I don't know if we can do about it, but we can discuss it some more. And here's Orban doing just that. Orban says insurance companies are partially to blame for folks shutting down access to private land. Back in the day, nobody saw letting somebody on to hunt as a liability. Well, I would, Orban, I would say that's not so much the insurance companies doing that as the lawyers, uh, people who want to press cases and get some business that way. So that's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's one of the problems. Insurance companies are just offering you an economic ability to stay viable. If you do want to let someone trespass and hunt on your place, you can get policies that would cover them cutting your finger or stumbling and breaking a leg or something so you don't get sued. But basically, though, that comes down to the individual hunter. Of course, the lawyers, insurance companies want to get a little money out of the deal. But if someone is foolish enough or greedy enough to sue you because he got injured through no fault of yours on your property while he was hunting, how ungrateful can you get? I mean, that's irresponsible to the max. Let's see what Joe has to say about this. Illegal immigration, Yanks moving south, massive land loss to development, and way overpopulated by about 50%. That's why we can't get good access to hunting lands. Yeah, Joe's got some points there. You know, it's just as I mentioned earlier, simple population numbers. You've got a finite amount of land and you have a finite amount of hunting land because much of that land is cities and waterways and highways and then crop fields. And the more people you get in, the more demand there uh, is for more highways and more cities and more crop fields and more energy and solar farms sprouting up. And, and it all takes a toll on wildlife habitat. So there's your decrease there. And as for people moving, you know, that's that's always an issue. Like the West used to be pretty much empty and wide open, but I moved here <laughs> and plenty of other people have moved here. And now the West is more like the East. You drive down the front range uh, in the Denver area or the Salt Lake area. And oh my gosh, you could swear you're in California. So, and that's just population. Now here's Richard. What does he have to say? Social media influences hunting. The best places due to their connections and the uh, influencers on social media, they give false hope to everybody else because they've got access and we don't. So hunting is becoming a cash crop and it will continue to slowly die. You know, that also has been predicted for quite some time, you know, as, as opportunities decline, it's pretty much supply and demand and somebody's going to have more money than you and they're going to buy that supply and you're going to just be out there demanding and not getting. <laughs> so that is a part of the issue. And then I've heard this more than once that social media influencers, and you could probably lump me in that category. I hate to be there, but uh, you, you, some say that we shouldn't celebrate hunting on social media. You shouldn't post photos. You shouldn't give instructions on how to hunt and, and all the rest of it. There's some validity to that, but it's a double-edged sword if we don't have more hunters as a significant percentage of the population to defend hunting and gun rights. We get run over by the masses who know nothing about it. You ask your average person who knows nothing about sustainable managed hunting, and they would easily sign a petition to outlaw hunting because they think they're going to save all the wildlife, not fully understanding that it's the hunters who are buying the habitat, improving the habitat, doing game reintroductions, managing the populations, controlling the poachers, and all the rest of it that have, have enabled us to restore wildlife in North America from 
1900, when so many species were on the brink of extinction, and look at the abundance now that we have of elk and pronghorns and black bears, and we've brought cougars back to abundance and wolves and just not just game animals, but all the wildlife that is supported on the same habitat that the big game animals need. It's a wonderful program, but the average citizen just doesn't understand it or appreciate it. So we do need people interested in hunting to support that and not just politically, but also by buying the licenses and the tags that pay for the game wardens and biologists and all the restoration work that Ducks Unlimited and Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and all the rest of them do. It's a big deal. Ah, okay. Now, (laughs) Chris, back in the day, a single shot was the tool. Now you need thousands of dollars of stuff. Well, that's a little bit true, Chris, but Really, we still have single shots. You don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on fancy rifles and fancy scopes and ATVs and thermal imaging and all the rest of the gizmos and gadgets. You can go as simple as you want and you don't need a lot of money to do it. Buy a basic single shot, learn to be a good stalker and a good hunter, and then use the money that you've saved to get access somewhere. I I hate to say you have to spend money to get on ground to hunt, but if those are your options and you love to hunt, boy, I would rather hunt with a simple stick and string bow and arrow on a good chunk of property than to have $10,000 worth of fancy equipment and no place to use it. Now, JB, what? Oh, now this is nice. JB's got a different attitude. My son just got his first whitetail today. I'm so proud of it. Bingo. There you go. There's always the upside, the optimistic side. Despite all of this grousing and all of these obvious problems that we do now have, we are still able to get out there and hunt and our kids can get their first whitetail. Whitetail hunting these days is probably still the biggest hunting in uh, North America, probably the most popular and most average folks can do it because whitetails are so abundant and you can usually find them even on a small chunk of ground, whether it's public areas in the Midwest and the East, or even in the West, a lot of whitetails in the West, or on a small chunk of private ground. There are so many folks now who get 20 acres, 40 acres, even 10 acres, and they can get deer on that chunk of ground if they optimize the habitat. So, there's something forward to look to look forward to there. There's a little bit of hope. So don't give it up and try to take an optimistic attitude. It's not all downhill here. All right. Now, let's see. We're going to change the subject a little bit. This looks like it's something about bullets from someone calling himself or herself lifted above. Nothing shaped like a sleek, sexy torpedo is optimal for dispatching an animal. That's the issue here on Ron's channel. Much to do about flight of bullets, like everyone is some kind of aerospace expert, (laughs) but literally next to nothing about bullet termination. The best anyone can muster is a non-scientific energy dump bucket of malarkey. People are laser focused on energy numbers. I'm here to say that biological life couldn't care less about your big energy numbers and your sleek, needle-shaped, sexy bullets. Well, lifted. I'm sorry to hear that, but uh, I beg to differ because those sexy needle-shaped bullets are contributing to terminal performance. I mean, you're absolutely right. Terminal performance is the be-all and end-all. But to get terminal performance, those long, sleek bullets help. They improve things. You retain more energy. They make it easier to hit your target at distance or in winds. And there's an advantage to that. So it helps you shoot more precisely, put your bullet where it belongs. And if you design that bullet properly, a sexy needle-shaped bullet can have the same or better terminal effect than a thumpy, stumpy, short, rounded, flat-nosed bullet. It's just the reality of physics. Those sleek bullets get there with more energy. And... They can be designed with the right materials and the right construction to expand as much as, if not more than, some more traditional round nose or flat nose bullets. So this is not all aerospace science. There is a lot of physics and stuff involved in it, but you don't have to understand all that to get a good bullet. 
Take your time to study and understand how these bullets work. Just because they sh have a sharp tip, that doesn't mean they're going to punch through like a needle and not put any energy or break up any tissues in the animal. And that's the important thing. It's really not so much the energy. A bullet only needs enough energy to get to the target. And once it gets there, to reach the vitals. So it needs to penetrate through the hair and the hide and the muscles and sometimes the bones. But most bullets will do that. I have used frangible 58, 55 grain varmint bullets at 3,400 feet per second launch speeds and gotten through the shoulder of a big white tail buck to reach the vitals. Not the recommended bullet, but it just goes to show that it can happen with some projectiles that we might not think are optimal or should even be used. So you don't have to so much worry about having, you know, an old fashioned blunt heavy bullet. Those work too, but it's a different process. Now, nothing wrong with the sexy needle nose if they are built properly. But thanks for bringing it up. That stuff is always worth discussing. All right, here's some uh, questions that Betsy brought to my attention. This is uh, from someone named Ian, and he is referencing a video we did on all bullets are the same, in which I discussed um, how the 270 Winchester and the 30 out six and a seven rim mag and a 300 mag and a 243 and a 25 out six and a bunch of these standard popular deer hunting cartridges are pretty much producing the same trajectories, the real similar drops at distance and real similar wind deflections, even though we tend to think that there's significant difference in the performance of these. So I did a video describing all that. You can look it up on my regular channel, Ron Spomer Outdoors YouTube. But let's see what Eon has to say after watching it. I really like your show, but this episode is just goofy. <laughs> Of course, you can make all the rounds perform similarly if you jerry-rig the bullet size. Well, Ian, I, that's a nice observation, but I didn't really jerry-rig the bullet size. I stuck with pretty traditional bullets in the weights that most deer hunters would use. Um, I didn't, for instance, go with a, uh, say, a 55-grain bullet in a 243 against a 220-grain sleek needle-pointed sexy bullet in a 300 Win Mag to show these differences. I went with the standards. Oh, I think it was a 180 Spire Point typical one in a 300 Win Mag and a similar in about a 160-ish grain in the 7 Rem Mag and the 270, 130 grain, all the standard stuff. And I think if you do a little ballistic research on some calculators, you will uh, discover that even when you change bullet weights, like say in the 270 Winchester, if you go from 130 grain fast, flat shooting bullet to 150 grain, heavy, slower, and going to drop a lot more, there really isn't that much drop difference at out to 300 yards or so. And that's what I used for my long range distance on this one, because that is, for most of us, a long shot. Most hunting is done somewhere out to 300 yards. And I would say a vast majority of game taken closer to 100 yards than it is to 300. Out in the West, yeah, we're going to fudge it more toward that 300 and even farther. But for most folks, out to 300, if you've got a bullet that'll get there without dropping more than three or so inches below your line of sight. You've got a maximum point blank range approaching 300 yards. You're good to go. And all of these cartridges do that. Um, obviously, you can go to the extremes with some of them and really improve things. And then when you go to 400 and 500 yards, yeah, there there gets to be significant difference. It adds up. But it's I didn't jerry-rig that stuff. So you guys just might want to look into it on your own because there's nothing like doing your own research and really studying those ballistic tables to begin to understand exactly what you're getting into. And the whole idea with this presentation was to let folks know that you don't have to obsess about a specific cartridge because they're not that much different. Nothing wrong with choosing the one that you think is optimal. I and mean, that's why we have so many of them. We all get to make our choices. But I think it does behoove us to make educated choices. So dive into that ballistics and all that. It's always fun to learn new things. All right, uh, Light Roast is talking about the 460 Weatherby. I did a piece on that a while ago, too. And he says, Canada banned the 460 Weatherby because the government considers it to be too powerful based on an arbitrary muzzle energy limit. An absurd country will make absurd rules, I guess. So I have to order the 416 Weatherby, and I look forward to receiving it this year. 
I'll let you know if I need to make use of the free health care up here for shoulder surgery. <laughs> That's pretty good, Light Roast. <laughs> that crazy. So the government, I don't know if this is true or not, but he's claiming that the government in Canada banned the 460 Weatherby Magnum cartridge because it's too powerful. Now, thinking back on history and all of the tragedies um, with people being killed and murdered by firearms, by golly, I, I guess you have to agree that the 460 Weatherby has just been rampaging through the cultures of several continents. It's just, yeah, we've got to get rid of that thing because it's just been too deadly for too long. Let me know how many... Um, Horrible murders, uh, killings, and such you've noted have been committed with a 460 Weatherby. I will be shocked to learn that there's more than one, unless it's the guy behind the gun who suffered the recoil. <laughs> oh, man. Ah, good. Thank you, Roy. Roy is asking us a pretty deep, deep question. What is a choke? Well, this is not the one we're thinking of. <laughs> In reference to a shotgun, the choke is a constriction of the bore near the muzzle that's designed to constrict the shot pellets so that they fly farther downrange before they spread out too far. You've got a whole pile of pellets inside of a shot shell, and once they leave the barrel, they begin to plane in the wind differently because each one of them is round, but not perfectly round. So one might sail off to the right at a pretty extreme angle. One might go pretty nicely straight, but they're all going to be moving a little bit differently. And the further they progress downrange from your barrel, the more that pattern of pellets spreads out. Well, they found out, oh, somewhere in the late 1800s, that if you restricted the choke to narrower than your bore, the uh, 12 gauge bore diameter nominally is 0.729 inches. They would constrict that down by a few thousandths of an inch and discovered that they could keep the pattern tighter downrange. So they had an improved cylinder. The cylinder bore is straight all the way through. The next choke is a very minimal one called the cylinder, uh, improved cylinder. And then there's modified and then there's full. And then they made steps in between there. And you can tweak all of that stuff to get just the right choke. But that's the basic idea. You, well, think of it as, as a water hose with one of those adjustable nozzles from a spray to a narrow pattern. Similar effect. It's a Venturi effect. So there you go. That's a choke. Dis Daddy. Ron, do you clean your rifles after hunting season to be stored away for next hunting season? No, because my rifles are all ready to go at all times. You never know when I might grab one to go out to do a little shooting. And that's pretty much true. I just clean them when they need to be cleaned and I keep them oiled so they don't rust but the end of the season, I don't necessarily clean them because my season doesn't really end. I can step outside to my range and do some shooting. We do these videos and that. But for most folks, I think it's probably a good idea. It's really smart. You know, you get back from some wet hunt somewhere and you're all worn out and tired and muddy and your clothes have to be taken care of. All your gear packed away and the tents dried out and all this other stuff. Don't neglect your firearm. You should probably clean that one first. So dry it clean it, oil it. You don't necessarily have to clean the bore. If you've only shot 10 times or less, and it's probably the case for most hunts, you really don't have a badly fouled bore that's not going to perform anymore. In my case, gosh, almost every rifle I've ever had, I could shoot it a lot more than 10 times before the accuracy started to suffer. So I don't necessarily clean the bore. Now, if you have a high powder volume cartridge and a fairly narrow bore, so think of 220 Swift, uh, 264 Win Mags, some of the new high velocity Magnum cartridges, even though they're not called Magnum necessarily, that um, is going to build up more carbon in the throat right in front of the uh, the neck or the mouth of the cartridge. And if that carbon builds up, it makes a ring and that can increase your pressure. So you want to keep that ring down and that requires more than just cleaning down the bore. That means cleaning in the chamber right at the throat. And one of the ways to do that is with a brush, nylon or bronze, and a drill, believe it or not. Some people would say, oh my gosh, you're going to destroy your barrel. But you get in that chamber 
just before the rifling starts with that brush and ream it out a little bit. That'll take out that carbon ring for you pretty quickly. And remember, bronze on a bronze brush is a lot softer than the steel in a rifle barrel. And if you're worried about bronze, just go with a stiff nylon brush. You're not going to harm steel with that. The pros use it. Professional long-range target shooters do that. Um, but yeah, to get that cleaned up, but then oil it against rust, even if you're living in Arizona. We're pretty dry out here in Idaho. We don't have a lot of rust issues, but boy, every once in a while, if I don't keep things nicely coated with oil or wax on the external surfaces to keep the moisture off the steel, you could get some rust. And inside of the bore, you definitely don't want rust. So I always push an oily rag through a real fine gun oil down the bore to get a layer inside of the bore. And then you can store it for the rest of the year, really, till your next hunting season if you need to. But you might want to check it once or twice a year just to make sure things are dry down in your gun storage area, wherever it is. But that's the trick. Good question. Oh, another 460 Weatherby from Roger. The 460 Weatherby is a contest gun. Contest gun. When you fire it, it's a contest to see who gets up first. You were the game you were shooting at. <laughs> okay, Roger, that was a good one. <laughs> the, yes, folks, if you're starting to under, get the idea of the 460 Weatherby Magnum recoils a bit, oh, yeah, I think you're up around 100 foot-pounds of recoil energy in that thing. Depends on the bullet you're shooting and how fast you drive it. This thing is an absolute monster. I think most of the guns that are chambered for it are weighing 13 pounds or more. Gun weight always helps tame down the recoil. All right, Jack, Mr. Spoomer, I would never replace my grandfather for you. <laughs> I can't blame you. I wouldn't either. But I would definitely never complain if you were my grandfather. Well, that's nice, Jack. I, I love all of your videos, and I appreciate you passing this invaluable knowledge to the younger generation so that our American heritage is continued. I wish you and your family the best from North Georgia. Jack, that was, I hate to say sweet, but it really was. That was very kind of you, uh, and I appreciate it. And I urge everyone else out there who's listening to uh, adopt a, a similar position of educating our youth and defending our our American heritage, as as Jack called it, because hunting and shooting, yeah, that is our American heritage, and it is under attack. They are both under attack, so we need to pay attention and uh, you know speak out, be polite about it, know your facts and figures, uh, be kind to folks, and just share what you know with them. I think it's our best chance. People just need to understand that we're not a bunch of wild, crazy redneck radicals or something out here like they try to portray us. <laughs> Well, maybe I am, but <clears throat> all right, let's see what the team has dragged out for us. Oh, hey, before we go there, got to jump jump in here and give a little sales pitch for my latest book, The 7 Millimeter Cartridges from Around the World, and it's pretty exhaustive. Um, I'm sure I missed a few oddball wildcats, but I tried to find as many as I could, and I think I came up with 14 or 15, maybe even 18 cartridges that are or recently were available as factory-loaded ammunition, and then I went into proprietary cartridges with a bunch of those, and then wildcats, and there's a crazy bunch of those. And I'm mean, telling you, we go everywhere from the little seven millimeter BR bench rest Remington all the way up to the ultra magnums and everything in between. And there are charts in there comparing their velocities and energies downrange. And there's even a cool one on the chronological development of the seven millimeters over time. So you get to see which was the very first one created and which one is the most recent and all the ones in between. Fun little book if you like seven millimeters. And I always tell folks that I think the seven millimeter cartridges, that particular caliber, 0.284 inch diameter bullet, I think that's the sweet spot for a hunting bullet because it's not too big, it's not too small, it is capable of handling all the game in the world and doesn't recoil as much as some of the bigger calibers, has high sectional density in the bullets, and it has high ballistics coefficients in the bullets without making them too heavy. 175 grain, 180 grain, seven millimeter bullet has uh, equal or better ballistics coefficient, meaning aerodynamic efficiency than a 212 to 210 grain bullet in a 308. So you've got less recoil, but you've got 
flatter trajectories and wind deflection advantages and et cetera, et cetera. So you might want to check it out. You might just dis discover that there's a seven millimeter out there that becomes your all time favorite. All right. Now let's see who uh, Philip is here from Missouri, what he's got going on. Philip asks with the military adopting the 6.8 by 51 millimeter CC and new cartridge being introduced like the 6.8 Western, will the 277 caliber, the 270, once again gain popularity? Can the 6.8 by 51 outperform its brothers, the 6.5 Creedmoor, the 260 Remington, the 7 millimeter 08? Or could the 6.8 Remington SPC regain popularity through military adoption of a 277 caliber cartridge? So in the civilian market, this 6.8 by 51 will be the new 277 Fury from Sig Sauer. And that's the one that the military is pushing the PSI, the uh, pressure in the chamber to a max of 80,000 PSI. So there's some argument about whether that will ever be available in a civilian firearm. I imagine it will be. Um, but good question, Philip. Will this make the 277s more popular? Yeah, I, d I think it definitely will. Um, remains to be seen how many people are going to jump on the 80,000 PSI bandwagon. But Without that pressure, the 6.8 by 51, the 277 Fury cartridge, is the 308 neck down to 270. And there's been a 2708 uh, Wildcat for a long, long time. Um, and it falls somewhere in between the 308 and the 7 millimeter 08 and the 260 Remington. They're all the basic, just change the neck size on it, shoot those, those bullets, and you get whatever performance you're going to get out of them with that pretty much the same powder supply. So the 277, you know, that's an interesting cartridge because it's so famous as the 270 Winchester, been around since 1925. Um, but there weren't that many others, the 270 Weatherby Magnum, and that was about it for a long time. Then that 6.8 SPC, special purpose cartridge, is really small and generally shoots no heavier than about 115 grain bullet. You can shoot the heavier ones and go almost subsonic with it and things, but that's a specialty cartridge. Uh, so that wasn't going to set the world on fire. But now we've got 27 Nosler, which is a real screamer. And then this 277 and the 6.8 Western, the 270 WSM, which was the parent of the 6.8 Western. And the Western has really brought the 270 into the modern 21st century cartridge field because it's got the fast twist barrel and then the longer bullets. Essentially, they took the 270 WSM case. They pushed that shoulder back a little bit so they could seat a longer bullet in a longer neck and then allow that bullet to still fit into the throat and fit into a short action. And then you have a longer bullet without protruding down into the powder space. Obviously, you gave up a little powder space when you pushed the shoulder back, but it's kind of important to keep the bullet from getting past the neck shoulder junction where you can build up a little donut of metal if you're hand loading and ch charging that case over and over again. Little things like that aren't real important for you if you don't hand load. But yeah, all of those things are suggesting that we're going to see more 277s. We've got new bullets now. Used to be you went from about a 90 grain hollow point Sierra bullets, the lightest one I ever knew of, um, all the way up to 160 grain round noses. Every once in a while, somebody would have 170 grain. But generally, you're looking at 130 grain for deer and 150 grain for elk. And that was your 270 Winchester. But we've got the horsepower now and the twist rates in some of these new ones where we're going to be able to use the new 165 grain, the 170 grain, and the 175 grain. Who knows what else is coming down the pike? Lucas from Michigan. Hi, Ron. I'm in the market for a lever action in 357 uh, since I am in a straight walled area of my state. I am cross dominant, which is why I'm looking to switch to a lever action for hunting cross eye dominant. So he's probably seeing with his left eye and shooting right-handed and having issues. So he wants to switch back to shooting left-handed. My main question is about the 357 mag loads and what to consider for the most effective shots. Should I go with a heavier and hard round like um, Buffalo bore or something lighter? I suppose for this season, I'll just stick with my 350 Legend and deal with the right-handed bolt. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of lefties who can shoot a left or a right-handed bolt pretty darn effectively, Lucas. And I'm guessing that if you're a good hunter, you are making one-shot count. And you really don't even need a fast recycling, right? 
And that's something that I think all lefties should consider. If you really don't want to get a new special rifle or something, and you're a good shooter or not a good shooter, become a good shooter, and you really don't have to worry so much about how quickly you can cycle the action. But if you do want a 357, that 357 Magnum revolver cartridge can be pretty effective for deer in a rifle. You get a longer barrel, and they're usually 18 inches. You are going to get probably 300 feet per second more velocity out of those the loads. And they've been proven time and again to be effective in a little six inch revolver barrel. So by adding 300 feet per second to a 158 grain bullet there, you're going to do a lot better. Uh, but those bullets are not going so fast that they're going to expand all that well. So I would probably go for as a soft nose or a hollow and and then probably go for the heavier weight so you make sure you really got that momentum and penetration because they're fairly short bullets. They don't have high sectional density, but they, they've been proven again and again to work if, as long as you put them in the right spot, which is that chest area, unless you get lucky and hit them in the spine somewhere. But I never advocate neck or head shots on deer because that part of the body can move so quickly. You think you're just about ready on a deer that's standing still. And by the time you're squeezing the trigger, it hears a sound or something and swings its head and you end up with a wounding shot or a complete miss. So stick with that right behind the shoulder or even on the shoulder shot where you're going to be hitting the heart and the lungs and uh, making a sure shot that'll take that animal out. All right, Billy in Texas. Ron, my question is in regards to an all-purpose rifle. I'm looking at the Springfield Waypoint, but I'm trying to decide between a 308 and a 6.5 PRC. I love the performance and availability of the 308, and I know that the 6.5 offers some advantages in trajectory and BC. It also comes with a 24-inch barrel versus the 20-inch of the 308 that I generally prefer lighter weight and a compact package. This would be for a yearly elk hunt in Colorado, as well as muleys and small East Texas whitetail. I should also mention that I won't be shooting more than 300 yards unless that bull of my dreams is at 400. And I'm confident that both rounds would be more than adequate, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Whew, boy, Billy, you're thinking very well through this whole process, but mm, boy, I wouldn't call either one of those optimal. But, and I know what you're saying about the 308 being easily available and all and pretty effective in a 20 inch barrel but boy the 65 prc is going to be your best bet for that beyond 300 yard shot the 308 starts to run out of steam and drop quite a bit you can always compensate for drop it's not like it's not going to work but boy if it were i choosing these i would go with that 6.5 prc the performance of that is quite similar to what the 270 winchester has been doing all these years and we know how well that works you go with 150 to 156 grain bullet in that 6.5. What are you shooting in a 270, 150 grain bullet for elk? So you've got a higher sectional density in that narrower bullet at that weight. And you have a higher BC. So you're going to reduce your wind deflection. So you could even be uh, see better performance out of it than the 270. Um, the 24 inch barrel though, eh, if that's bugging you. Yeah. Then you might want to stick with that 308, but I would run some numbers on the 6.5. I can't tell you right offhand what it's going to do out of a 20 inch barrel. Obviously that is not ideal for it, but you're probably only going to lose about 30 feet per second for every inch of barrel you cut off. So lop four inches off of that barrel. 120 feet per second, you're still shooting faster than a 6.5 Creedmoor. And a lot of people are taking deer and elk with the 6.5 Creedmoor and 142 and 143 grain bullets. So I think you will be all right. Um, boy, that's how I'm analyzing it right now. Um, you might compromise with a 22 inch barrel in the, in the 6.5 PRC. That might work for you, but either way, you're going to be all right. I've just never been a huge fan of the 308, but it is a grand cartridge that can do it all. It's just not quite the speed demon that you're going to get out of that 6.5. So good luck to you. I think you're going to do well with either one of them as long as you practice and become a proficient shot with them. You'll know what to do. All right, Chris from Illinois. Hello, Ron. My son is nearly 12. He's taken some whitetails here in Illinois with archery equipment. Well, good for him. And when I was 12, I was only dreaming of taking a deer. <laughs> 
His muzzleloader, oh, he's taking over with his muzzleloader as well. And this year we're hunting with a Ruger American Ranch in 350 Legend. He just used that 350 Legend to take his first hog in Texas, a 210 pounder. Wow. This kid's rolling. <laughs> it performed well. He is hooked on hunting. Well, that's great. I plan to take him on more adventures in the next few years. Chris, you are a good dad. And uh, your son is a lucky son. Uh, specifically, I'm going to take him pronghorn and coos deer hunting. My question revolves around the caliber and rifle selection. I shoot a Tika T3X, and I think it's a great rifle. They make a compact model, but here's my conundrum. I don't really want to go to a 243. I would really prefer to get him a 25-06 because it's such a great flat shooting cartridge with low recoil. Tika doesn't chamber for 25-06 Remington. My next choice would be a 7mm 08, but I'm not sure I even prefer that to the 25-06. The rifle would be mainly used for deer, pronghorn, and hogs. Elk on our menu, but in the foreseeable future, no. But what are your thoughts? The 243 and the 7mm 08 come in shorter, handier rifles. Seems that a 25-06 is optimal in a 24-inch barrel. I've never actually shot any of these calibers. I only have a 30 out 6 and a 300 Win Mag. Any advice on caliber and rifle selection would be appreciated. Boy, yeah, you've got a lot to chew here, Chris. First of all, any of them are going to work. I, I think you probably know that, but you're right to think about short action versus standard length. Not a huge difference, but you're talking about a smaller frame shooter here. Uh, the 25-06 is not all that popular, and it doesn't really shoot all that heavy of a, of a bullet. 120 grain with a flat base and a typical spire point will stabilize in most of them, but you're not going to get these long, sleek bullets that heavy. You can get some that are about 115 grains to maybe 117 grains at the top end from Nosler and Hornady and several others that are a little higher BC, but boy, if they had more weight in them, they would be even higher BC. And then you're starting to talk about matching up with the 6.5s. So... You can do pretty darn well with the 25 out 6 and a 100 grain all copper bullet. I have used those a lot, even down to a 90 grain. I used a 92 grain hammer hunter on that in my 25 out 6, and I could scream that thing. Those things shoot so fast. So there's an option there, but then you're back to the standard length, 30 out 6 length action. If you want to stick with your short actions, you need to pop up on the 6.5 scale here. And I hate to say 6.5 grade more because so many people hate it, but I'll tell you, 260 Remington, but you're probably not going to find it chambered. It's a great cartridge. It's the 308 neck down to 26, but then you look at the powder supply in that, and it is so close to the Creedmoor that you might as well get the Creedmoor because they probably chamber in the Creedmoor. So you've got a short action. You're shooting bullets as heavy as 147 grains probably, and the 140s and 142s and 3s are just optimized for minimal wind deflection, um, but you get 129, 130 grain bullets are going a little bit faster, shoot a little bit flatter. There will be less recoil. Get the right bullet and have your son park it in the right place. It's going to do just fine. That's what I would be recommending about all your choices here. I mean, as much as I am biased toward the 25 out 6 myself and the 243, I would not discount that one. I've had such great luck with it. But I think you're going to do better at longer ranges and heavier game, especially if you decide to try for an elk with it with that 6.5. I have many friends who have taken elk reliably and routinely with the 6.5 Creedmoor that it can be done. And again, people are going to chew me out and say, I don't know what I'm talking about and I'm irresponsible, but there's just too many people have had great success with that. And the fact that that 6.5 by 55 a Swede cartridge, which does pretty much the same ballistics with the same bullets as the Creedmoor, and that's been celebrated around the world for being effective on moose and elk. Say so you've got to go with it. <laughs> okay. Now from Las Cruces, New Mexico, Edward. Hello, Ron. I love your show. Boy, I, you know, I like you already, Edward. <laughs> I'm thinking of buying a Savage 110 Tactical that I can take hunting, but also use it as a fun target rifle. I'm really interested in the 6mm ARC. It has impressive ballistics for such a light recoiling round. The problem is I can't seem to find any ammo or components other than what Hornady offers. Do you think I should get a different cartridge like the 6.5 Creedmoor, or do you think there will be more offerings from other manufacturers in the future? 
thanks. Yeah, Edward, good thinking. That 6.5 arc is the new stubby little cartridge. And I think Hawa chambers their rifles in their mini action. If you want a short action, you don't just get short action. You get shorter than short action in their mini action. That thing is really fun. Um, but boy, I think you're right about the ammunition. It's kind of, it's not a proprietary cartridge, but it's unusual enough that not everybody has latched onto it. And I think a lot of these ammo companies, given today's market and their inability to keep up with demand on standard cartridges, they're probably not going to jump into loading the arc. Uh, whereas Hornady obviously has to because they came out with it. So I don't have any problem shooting Hornady ammo if I had a six uh, ARC. Um, unless you don't like their bullets. Some people don't. They, I don't know how many different options they have in that particular one, but if you find a bullet from Hornady that you like, I don't see whether you've got a real issue with buying their ammunition. It should shoot well in your rifle. The ones that I've tried, it does. So, um, But yeah, sensibly, I think you're on the right track by going with a cartridge like that 6.5 Creedmoor, which everybody loads for. If you're worried about ammunition choices, and you know, when a lot of folks find that certain rifles just don't like certain ammo, and if there's only two or three options out there and your rifle doesn't like any of them, you're kind of up the creek. Whereas you go with something like a Creedmoor or the 308 Winchester, where you've got 64,000 different loads out there, you're probably going to find one that works well in your rifle. So I think I'm going to have to roll with the 6.5 Creedmoor for you. So good luck with that. Dylan in California. I was thinking about hunting black bear and black tailed deer with a 7 millimeter Remington Magnum with either a 120 grain or 140 grain Barnes TTSX. What are your thoughts? Would that be good enough for bear? This is an easy one. Yes. It's all you need to hear, man. It's going to work for you. Either one, you can get that 120 grain screaming. They're both going to do the job. All right, Paul from, ooh, this is different. The Yukon up in Canada, up in the Yukon. Oh, big moose country. Hi, Ron. I'm a big fan. I hunt moose. See, didn't I tell you it was moose country? I hunt moose every year in the Yukon, and I'd be interested in hearing more of your moose stories through Spotify. Well, you know what? I've been itching to tell some moose stories, Paul. I don't know that I'm going to tell one now, but since you've reminded me, maybe I'll scratch my head and think of one that I can tell in an upcoming episode. Let's see what else you have to say here. Also, a question. Have you ever made dried meat or tried it from the Northern First Nations? It's kind of like jerky, but the way we make it, if made correctly, it can last upwards of 10 years. Boy, I don't know, Paul. I have never made jerky that lasted 10 days, let alone 10 years. It's so good, I generally eat it pretty quickly. But let's keep reading here. I make it by cutting large, thin slices of meat, almost like a large pizza base, but thinner. And I hang it up in an enclosed shed, and then we use rotten wood to keep the smoke going. We smoke it for a couple of days nonstop. And once it is mostly changed to a dark color with a little splash of, or squish, a little bit of squish like the end of your wrist before the hand. What? Squish. Okay, I feel it. I'm feeling it. A little bit of squish left in it. And then some spices of your choice add a small amount of flavor. The meat hardens and it tastes delicious and it's considered a delicacy up in the First Nations. If you haven't tried it, I highly recommend it. It works with deer also, deer and moose. Well, I bet it'll work with caribou and elk and everything else. So it's just heavily smoked and that's why it can last upwards of 10 years. Does this sound legit to anybody else out there? Paul, how old of this jerky? Have you eaten successfully? <laughs> Obviously, you're still alive to type, so it couldn't have killed you. But how long have you tried it? I keep it. I mean, my standard jerky that I make will get moldy if I leave it out for, oh gosh, after about five to seven days, it starts to get this white mold on it. And I have found that I can stick it back in the oven and sort of burn it off or even wash it off, but I've eaten some with a little bit on it and never gotten sick from it. So I don't know what exactly that issue is all about, but I tend to make small batches and then keep them in the refrigerator and sometimes the freezer to prevent that. And then I'll take them, thaw them out and take them hunting or something as I need them. But boy, if I could find some that would last for 10 years, I think I'd be good to go. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm going to try it or not. Maybe I'm going to let my audience try it 
few of you folks have got a lot of meat here. You want to make some First Nations jerky that last 10 years, smoke the heck out of it <laughs> and get back to me. And let's just see how effective this stuff is. And Paul, if you've got a chance, send us a photo of some of that stuff or even a video of you and your friends either making it and or eating it, mostly eating it. And then I want to see the after effects the next day. <laughs> That looks like everybody today. Gosh, I want to thank all of you guys, Chris and Billy and Paul and Lucas and Philip and, and Edward and Dylan and uh, Joe and Richard and Rock and Chris and JB. And gosh, you guys, you come up with some really interesting topics. Give us a lot to talk about, share and think about. And as I often said, the more information we share and the more we discuss it, the more we fully understand it and educate ourselves so that we can make the right choices. And I think we encourage one another to be better hunters, better shots, better citizens all the way around, and better ambassadors for our sport. And I think that's critical. So until next time, on Honest and Shoot Straight. Mm -hmm.